Hi guys, my name is Pass, well, it's Kay, and uh, I'm a pastor here, at one of the pastors here at Church on the Ridge, and it's so glad to have you guys. Good to have you guys joining us online as well. We've been in a talk series called We Get To, and it's kind of looking at the things that we get to do as a follower of Christ. We talked about prayer for a few weeks, and we looked at the Lord's Prayer, which is Jesus' kind of example prayer to his students. Uh, we get to be baptized. We looked at that. We get to serve the body of Christ. We looked at that last week. And today we're going to talk about we get to scatter seeds. Now on the screen, you'll see 2,000-year-old seeds. These are the seeds of a Judean date palm that, own, that doesn't grow in Israel anymore. It grew in Israel at the time of, of Jesus, and then they went extinct in that area. It's called the Tamar tree in scripture, if you ever read about that. That's the tree. It's the, it's the palm tree that the people grabbed palms from to wave on Palm Sunday to welcome Jesus into Jerusalem. Those are these seeds. Now meet Methuselah. This is the tree that was grown from those 2,000-year-old seeds. This was grown by Dr. Elaine Soloway, who's a horticulturist who lives on a kibbutz in Israel, who's trying to bring the desert back to life with some of the extinct plants that used to grow there. And those seeds were found in an archaeological dig in Masada, which was a fortress built in southern Israel, and they found them in the 1960s. And a friend of Dr. Elaine's got a hold of her and said, hey, I got a challenge for you. You want to see if you can germinate some of these ancient seeds? And so Dr. Elaine took the seeds, soaked it in some hot water, had a little fertilizer liquid that she soaked it in, made out of seaweed, and then all she could do was put it in the ground and wait and see what happened. And in March 2005, she noticed a crack in the soil, and she had a Judean date palm tree growing. This picture was taken in 2021, 19-year-old Methuselah. Um, and this is when the journalists and the dignitaries from Israel showed up to eat the dates that were fathered by Methuselah. I, or Jane, Jane Good, Goodall, who is the uh, gorilla scientist, she wrote in her books, Seeds of Hope. She wrote this about these ancient seeds. Within a 2,000-year-old seed, a germ of life was still alive waiting, waiting, waiting for the right conditions to wake, like Rip Van Winkle into a strange and different world. I've been growing and germinating seeds since I was a kid. In middle school, um, I grabbed, I used to take all my mom's seeds catalogs. My parents had a vegetable garden every year, and they would grow vegetables and zinnias, and I wanted some exciting flowers. So I would just look through that seed catalog and look at all the things I could grow. And finally, I convinced her to, to buy me two seed packets. We didn't have a lot of money, so mom knew she was just throwing away money buying me seeds. But she did, and I got money plant seeds and baby's breast seeds, and I stuck them in the ground, and nothing grew. In high school, I, um, my science experiment, you know, you have one big science experiment, I germinated seeds and then watered the plants with different liquids to see which liquid would help the plant grow best. So I had water, coffee, milk, uh, sweet tea. I did grow up in Georgia. Um, I didn't really get a good grade. I'm not a science person, I'm a word person. So, um, and ever since I've been married, since I was a young married person, I've had gardens. And I like to challenge myself each year to try a different seed to see if I can get it to grow. And so through the years of lots of failure, I've discovered that, you know, you have to have the right conditions for a seed to germinate. Uh, if you plant a seed too far into the ground, it, it doesn't, it's not triggered to, to sprout and grow. Some seeds need light to germinate. And so if you've ever tried to grow carrots and failed, you can thank me later. Here's how you do it. You put the carrot seeds on top of the soil, because they like light, and then just kind of sprinkle some sand or vermiculite over the top of it, and then those will germinate. Some seeds like the ground to be just the right temperature. Tomato seeds, try to grow, start them too early, they're not going to germinate. You can stick a heat mat underneath of them, and they'll pop right up. So I could talk about seeds all morning, but we're here to talk about Jesus. Funny enough, though, Jesus liked to talk about seeds, too. 
In fact, he used many seed and farming illustrations to make points about Jesus, to teach, or to make points about God, about who God is. And he would use these metaphors of seed and soil and plants to, so that people would digest and think about what it was he was actually talking about. We call these metaphors parables. And in Mark 4, we have three seed parables. Now you probably know, some of you may know the first one, which is the more famous one, where he says, you know, seeds will land on different soils, and different soils will bring forth, well, some will germinate, some won't, and different things will happen to the plant. Uh, And then the one after the one we're gonna talk about today is the mustard seed parable. You guys have heard of those, but this one right here in the middle sometimes is overlooked. So we're gonna look at, Jesus is teaching on the seed in Mark 4, 26. Let's, you guys can read quietly along with me, or you don't have to read out loud. I know we did that for the Lord's Prayer. Just read with your eyes. Here we go. Jesus also said, this is what the kingdom of God is like. A man scatters seed on the ground, night and day. Whether he sleeps or gets up, that seed sprouts and grows, though he doesn't know how. All by itself, the soil produces grain. First the stalk, then the head, then the full kernel in the head. And as soon as the grain is ripe, he puts the sickle to it, because the harvest has come. So first off, we see that the person scatters seed. And the word here for person is the Greek word anthropos. And it just is a generic word for a person. It could be a man or a woman. It means humankind, just person. It's generic. It's not a specific word. In the previous parable, Jesus says that a farmer goes out to plant. This is just a person. Notice he scatters the seed. The word here is throw, toss. This is a casual action. He doesn't really care where the seed falls. He's not planting, it's not deliberate or orderly. Um, if you look at the, the screen, here's a picture found in a mosaic in the second, from the second century of someone, a person just scattering the seed. He's just like, woo, 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 wherever it goes. We've got this tool nowadays, you know, this spreader, right, that casts grass seed out or fertilizer and just random, just hits it, hits it wherever it needs to go. That's what this is talking about. It's not individual seeds, it's a wide cast. Many seeds at one go. So all those things that I talked to you about at the beginning, about germinating seeds and being really careful with them, this is not that at all. This is a random person tossing seeds about and hoping for the best. So the seed that he tosses out germinates and grows without help from the person. You know, and Jesus isn't really talking about good practices for farming here. He has a deeper meaning. He's using an illustration that everyone in the ancient world would understand because they all had to grow food to eat. The seed stands for something else. And it's always a good practice when reading scripture to look at context, like where is this verse situated in the verses around them? What is Jesus talking about? And when we look at the context of this parable, we get the parable right before it, where Jesus tells us what the seed is. In Mark 4, Jesus says that the seed that is sown, it is the word. In Luke 8, 11, which is a sister passage, he says it very clearly. The seed is the word of God. More specifically, the seed is the word of God that Jesus taught and lived. Jesus is the living word, so it's his life as well. In Mark 1, Jesus was just starting his ministry, and he comes, and this is what he proclaims. These are his words. He says, the time has come. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. Now, the seed is good news. And we're reading this in English, but in Greek, that word good news is euangelion. That's the Greek word. Sometimes it's translated gospel, so you've if you've been to church in any amount of time, you've heard that word gospel. Well, that just means good news, euangelion. It's where we get the word evangelist from, somebody who scatters the seed, scatters the good news. Uh, in the ancient world, the only way to communicate to somebody, to, sell, to communicate news to somebody, to spread a message, is by word of mouth. They didn't have email, they didn't have 
radios, they didn't have TV, they didn't have the postal service, they didn't have cell phones. So you would pay a scribe to write your message down, or you could go to a messenger and pay them to memorize your message, and then that messenger would then have to travel, find the person that you wanted to give the message to, and then give the message. And if it was good news, like if, um, if the news was coming to a king that the battle was won, or if the news was coming to a businessman in a far city that his wife successfully had a child and they were doing well, that was good news. And so they would then tip the messenger or give him like an extra payment, a reward. That reward, that tip, that's the euangelion in Greek. Everybody knew what that was. That's what you gave to a messenger who had good news. Over time, they kind of blended together and the good news itself became the euangelion. And so Jesus is saying that the seed that this person is scattering is good news. It's a euangelion. It's good news about Jesus. In John 12, 24, Jesus says, unless a kernel of wheat or a seed, that's a seed, falls to the earth and dies, it remains a single seed. But if it dies, it becomes many seeds. And I was out in the garden this morning and picked a pea pod off one of my plants. And these pea pods, you know, have 10 seeds in them and there's hundreds of those pea pods on my plants. And Jesus is saying, unless this seed falls to the earth and dies, it stays one. But if it dies, it brings forth many. And Jesus was talking about himself. Like a seed, Jesus died. He was buried in the earth, and he came back to life. And the kingdom of God grows from this seed, the good news about Jesus. From death, a dead seed, the death of Jesus, comes life. The good news is that death is not the end of our story. We're like a seed. It's the beginning. The gospel, the good news, the euangelion is vital to every person's life story because the good news answers three questions that we all have about ourselves. Who am I? What's the point of my life? Why am I here? And what's gonna happen to me when I die? Who am I? Well, I'm a mess. I think we all are a bit broken and flawed or a lot broken and flawed. And there is nothing in this world that has the answers to fix us. Try therapy, try medicine, try relationships. We're all doomed to die. Nothing's going to fix us. But the good news is that we were created, I was created, you were created, to know and be loved by God. And when we invite Jesus into our life as a best friend, Charlie likes to say as a CEO of our life, Bible language is Lord of our life. Then he comes in and like a seed, begins to transform us and bring new life. What happens when I die? Well, the good news is that when I die, it's like a seed. I go into the ground, I'm buried, like Jesus himself. Death and burial is the beginning of new life. Those who trust Jesus are welcomed into eternal life, true life after death. The good news is not that you should try harder to be a good person, to live a clean life, so that God will give you a good life, a blessed life, and let you into heaven after you die. That's not the gospel. It is that you are accepted by God right now when you trust Jesus. Tim Keller likes to, to say the good news like this. I am more flawed and broken than I could possibly understand, but I am more loved and accepted than I could possibly hope for. There is more to living than this life. You have a greater purpose than just this life. So when people hear the good news, and they believe it. When they hear it, they believe it, they trust it, that little seed, that mysterious seed in, into the ground where you can't see what's happening begins to sprout, put down roots and grow. And maybe you're sitting this, here, here this morning and you've heard the seed, you've heard that good news and you're like, wait, I think I would believe that, I trust that. There's a crack in the soil, like you know, Dr. Elaine Soloani who, who did the, the Methuselah, who germinated those 2,000 year old seeds. It's a crack in the soil and there's a sprout beginning to grow. 
You don't need to wait any longer. Let those roots grow today, and after our gathering, we'll have a, a quick time of prayer. We would love to pray with you, show you how, what it means to trust Jesus. So the good news is the seed, and it brings salvation, it brings new life. And scattering seed, you got the, the image of the seed scatterer, Sa scattering seed is sharing the good news. Evangelism, euangelion. Mark 4.15 says that the word is sown like seeds in a field. Uh, the first parable says that some of those seeds land on different soils and they have different results, but that's not what the parable we're talking about is teaching. This one tells us that we get to scatter seeds. We get to tell good news to the hopeless. We get to share at work, in your neighborhood, at your kids' sports games, in the doctor's office, in coffee shops, we broadcast the seed, and that means that we have lots of gospel encounters. It's an odd day when we're not sharing something about Jesus. 2 Corinthians 5.20 says that, therefore we are ambassadors of Christ, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore people to be reconciled to God. How do we do this? Well, the first step is really easy. We pray. Colossians 2, 4, 2 through 6 says that we should devote ourselves in prayer. That God may open doors so that we can present the message. We can share. So that we can proclaim it clearly. We pray for those opportunities. We, we pray that we see the opportunities and then we make the most of them. That we may know how to answer and be clear in our answers when people ask us, ask us about our faith. A famous person said, and I couldn't find who said it, but this isn't from me. He said, talk to God about others more than you talk to others about God. You can do that, right? Talk to God about others more than you talk to others about God. I have a list of people that I've been praying for, some of them for decades, that God would bring the seeds of faith that have been planted in their lives to life. Some of my closest, dearest friends, people I love the most, are not believers. And I'm praying for those seeds so we can pray. Secondly, we can take a risk. Do you know, do people in your life know that you're a Jesus person? Do they know you go to church? It can be a bit risky to let people know about your faith. Romans 1.16 says, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. You know, the gospel, that seed, that's the power. It's not you. You're not the power unto salvation. But it's the story. It's the good news. And we don't need to be ashamed of it. You could ask friends about their faith. You could say something like, my faith in Jesus is really important to me. How about you? Do you have a faith practice? And then just listen. You don't have to say anything just yet. The time will come. But open the conversation, conversation, the doors. Let people know you're a Jesus person. There's a couple in our church, and they're not, oh, they are here, all right. There's a couple in our church that take a walk around the neighborhood in Snoqualmie every day, and they talk to people that they meet. And they strike up conversations, and they build relationships with them, and they aren't afraid to be a little awkward to bring the conversation back to Jesus. Notice spiritual tie-ins when you're talking to people. You know, what could I, what could I connect this to, to eternity? Um, this one happens a lot. People have problems, right? My mom's sick. My kids are in trouble. Um, I have test results coming in. I've got a big decision to make. I was in a car crash. Use those opportunities to say, would you like me to pray for you? They might be like, no, that's not my thing. Or they might be like, yeah, okay, I, sure. And then pray in front of them. I had a procedure a few weeks ago, and I was a bit nervous about it. And so I asked the doctor before he started, you know, I'm a little nervous. Do you mind if I just pray before this procedure and um, that you do everything right and then I come out of this okay? <laughs> and he was like, okay, uh, sure. No one's ever asked me that before. And I'm like, well, uh, is there anything I can pray for you for? Do you have anything in your life going on? And he was taken aback and he rambled on for like 10 minutes about world peace. <laughs> and so I prayed for world peace and that he would do my colonoscopy the right way. And... Uh, <laughs> 
<laughs> and so, you know, he says, more people need to do this. More people need to pray. It's a great opportunity. Did that, did that plant a seed in his life? I don't know. Did it make a difference for God's kingdom? Maybe. Did it, could that irritate some people? Probably. Can God use it? Absolutely. The key is just to do something. Just do something. Bill Hybels says just walk across the room. Sometimes, you know, he tells a story of when he was at a party and he was having fun with all of his friends and he looked over and he noticed a guy was standing by the drink table all by himself and he was like, no, I gotta walk over there and talk to him. You know, he was having fun and he had to give that up. He had to get out of his comfort zone to go talk to somebody he didn't know, introduce himself, and he did. And of course, the end of the story is eventually, a few years later, that man came to know Jesus. Get out of your comfort zone, plant a seed, do something. Uh, we've got invite cards to the church. Grab a stack and just give them to people in the grocery store. Use the church, say, hey, come, come to church with me on Sunday mornings. Share one of our talks uh, with someone who may be going through something that it might be applicable to. Share a daily encouragement on social media. Share what you're reading in the Bible in the first 14 minutes of your day with somebody. Be a little awkward. Not only share good news, be good news. Matthew 15, 16 says, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. When's the last time someone went, oh, thank you God, that person just came by because you were good news. Bring in your neighbor's trash cans for them. Mow the, ask them if you can mow their lawn while you're out there or weed eat, don't weed eat their flowers, please, but weed eat for them or um, f bring them flowers for their birthday. Stop and chat. I have a friend who every time she would go to Costco, she would text all of her neighbors and say, I'm doing a Costco run, what do you guys need? There is no better news than that, that someone else will do a Costco run for you. And so then she would take the opportunity to drop off what they needed. You know, they do the Venmo thing back and forth and then she'd stop and chat. And she had more opportunities to plant seeds because she was in their lives doing things for them. She was being good news, love people well. But let's go back to our parable about scattering seed. After tossing the seed, the person does nothing and knows nothing. Verse 27 says that night and day, whether he sleeps or gets up, the seed sprouts and grows, though he doesn't know how. The person's activity is to scatter, to rest, to get up and repeat. It's not his job to figure out how to get that seed to grow. He doesn't have any idea how that seed sprouts. It's a bit mysterious to him, but he isn't worried about it. He rests. He understands that his job is to scatter and wait. Think through when Dr. Elaine sprouted those ancient date seeds. She knew the best practices for getting seeds to sprout, but she still had to put the seed into the soil and let the mysterious action of germinating from death to begin. She had to wait and watch. And some of us worry about, you know, getting the right time and place just right so that when we plant that seed, it'll grow. Um, you know, we, we wait till the soil is most receptive before we say anything. Sometimes we plant a seed and then we nag about it. Like, did you get it? Did you get it? Did you get it? I think of that meme, uh, you might have seen it on social media where the guy is chasing a dog or a deer or people use his voices where he's like, uh, excuse me, sir, do you have a minute to talk about our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ? Hey, don't run from the Lord. Where are you going? Okay, that's not the skeed seed scatterer. He's a little worried. Sometimes we just can't rest because we think it's up to us to, think, to get that seed to grow. But the seed grows automatically. Verse 28 says that all by itself, the soil produces grain. First the stalk, then the head, then the full kernel in the head. And that word by itself is automatos. It's uh, automatically by itself. Jesus assures us that we don't have to get that seed to germinate and grow. That's the job of the seed. It will grow on its own. The word will not return void. It won't return invalid. It has power. Growth is happening between planting and harvest, but we can't affect someone's conversion or their salvation. The apostle Paul who wrote much of the New Testament put it this way. He said, I, Paul, 
planted the seed, Apollos, who was another Christian, kind of a missionary worker with Paul, Apollos watered the seed, but God made it grow. God makes the seed grow, not us. So if you're tossing seeds of good news, you don't have to be anxious about the growth. But you can expect a harvest. The person expects a harvest. Verse 29, as soon as the grain is ripe, he calls for the sickle because the harvest has come. And this is the point of the seed metaphor of Jesus. Gospel seeds grow into gospel plants. Sharing the good news works. Where there's a lot of seeds, we're going to see some growth. God's kingdom grows when we scatter seeds. I want to close with the story of a man called Frank Jenner. And this story was told and made popular and made known by a pastor whose name was Francis Dixon. There's a documentary made about it. There's a book you can read. This guy even has his own Wikipedia page. Um, And in the 1950s, Francis Dixon was a pastor in Bournemouth, England. And um, he had a man in his church named Peter who had come to his church begging to hear more about Jesus. And that doesn't often happen, and so Francis was like, well, tell me a little bit about this. And Peter said, well, I'm a sailor back during the war. This is World War II. I was on leave in Sydney, Australia, and I was walking down George Street, and this man walked up to me and asked me a question. He said, if you died within 24 hours, where would you be in eternity, heaven or hell? And Peter couldn't shake that question, and so eventually he found his way to Pastor Dixon's church, found Jesus, and went all in. And in fact, in the documentary, his son and his grandson are sharing their faith as well. And the thing was, Peter wasn't the only one. Pastor Dixon was telling the story, and he found that there was another guy in his church, Nori Jeffs, who was also a sailor in World War II, who was also on leave in Australia, and was walking down George George Street, and a man approached him and asked him the exact same question. Well, Dixon, this pastor, had an opportunity to go to Australia on a preaching tour, and while he was there, he was determined to get to the bottom of who this guy was, that, this evangelist, the seed scatterer in Australia who was asking sailors this question. And so he started his tour in the city of Adelaide, and he was sharing the story of these sailors and this man who was planting seeds along George Street. And as he was telling the stories, a guy in the audience started waving his hands and said, hey, I'm another, I'm another. And his name was Murray Wilkes. And he too was a sailor on leave and had this man walk up and ask him the question. While he was in Perth teaching, he told the story again, and you know where this is going, found another man who was approached, didn't respond right away, but began to think about it and gave his life to Jesus two weeks later at an army barrack. Well, by the time Francis Dixon got to Sydney, where where this man was, he found uh, the church he was in, he asked some of the Christian workers, told them the story, he said, do you know who this guy is? And Alec, one of the Christian workers, said, yeah, I know him well. That's Frank Jenner. He's still asking that question. And like me, he was a sailor, and he worships at one of the Christian Brethren Assemblies in Sydney. Let me hook you up. And Francis Dixon and his wife went and had dinner with, at Frank's house, Frank Jenner's house. And Frank told him the stories of these people that he had met who had come to Jesus because of this question he asked him. And Frank began to weep, and he fell on his knees, and he thanked God. And he said, you know, I never heard that anyone I spoke to had ever gone on for God. Some made professions, and they claimed, yeah, they're going to follow Jesus when I told them. But I never knew any more than that. You see, Frank had been the black sheep kind of a black sheep sort of man. He was the youngest in his family. He was a rebel. He was kicked out of his house when he was a teenager. He lived in the States, so he joined the Navy. And then he went AWOL and ended up in England. Joined the British Navy, and he ended up jumping ship in Australia. And while he was in Australia, he ended up in the Australian Navy. And through all of this, he had developed a terrible gambling addiction. He was addicted to the game of craps. 
And in fact, that game was what led him to the Lord because as he was walking down George Street, there were some street preachers there who said, hey, mister, do you have a minute to let us talk to you about something? And he goes, yeah, I'll listen to you if you win this game of craps. And obviously he lost. The Lord was in those dice and he had to go to a prayer meeting with them where eventually he found Jesus. Frank knew he was broken. He had weaknesses. That gambling addiction stayed with him for a long time, even after he came to the Lord. He knew he was broken, yet he knew the grace and love of Jesus. He knew he was accepted by God now. And he vowed to share the good news with 10 people a day for the rest of his life. And he was so aware of his weakness and he was so afraid to do this that he kept a little card in his jacket that he would pull out and read to himself before each day when he went out on George Street. And it said, I can do all things through him who gives me strength. Well, Pastor Dixon went on telling the story no matter where he went, you know, sharing the story. And of course, you know what's going to happen. He found more people. He was preaching in Keswick, England, and someone was like, I'm another. Yep, that guy asked the question to me. He was preaching in India, and a young woman started to cry, and she says, I'm another. And she was serving as a missionary in India as a result of that seed that Frank Jenner had planted. In all, Frank knew, uh, Francis knew of 10 people who had become fully devoted followers of Jesus because of Frank Jenner's seed scattering. So for 28 years, Frank committed to telling 10 people a day. He was consistent and persistent. His question shocked and startled people. That's a bit of a shocking question. And it's a method that doesn't work for most, pe most people. One guy tried it and, um, and it came off a little uh, threatening, right? If you were to die today, you know, that kind of a thing, and he got punched. So <laughs> it's not the sowing method that matters. It's the planting of seeds that does. And so doing the math, Frank Jenner planted over 100,000 seeds, each one full of potential to grow into a head full of more seeds to plant. We plant seeds and then rest because God makes his kingdom grow. Now, most of us aren't called to scatter the amount of seeds that Frank Jenner planted, but how about we commit to planting just one? One seed that falls to the ground and dies has the potential to grow into a seed head full of more seeds. Will you commit to planting a seed this week? Will you stand up with me, please? Leaders, AC members, prayer team, you guys may come forward. I'd like to invite all of you into a time of response to God's word. As Rachel closes us in song, you know, maybe you just heard that we get to scatter seed. You, di you didn't think, oh, I thought it was just pastors and missionaries who could share the gospel. I didn't know I could share the gospel. Would you commit to doing that and becoming a seed scatterer? Maybe you know you're supposed to be scattering seeds and as you're listening, you're like, a number came into your head and you're like, 10 a day, that's too much, but I could do one a day. And you're ready to commit to that to God. Like Frank Jenner, you're like, God, I'm going to do that because I want to see your kingdom grow. You can respond to how God is moving in your heart with your feet by coming forward to pray. Some of you don't trust Jesus yet and you're right on the edge and you're feeling it grow. Would you come forward and pray with somebody? We would love to lead you to Jesus. Please come forward and commit to planting seeds this week. Be like Frank Jenner. Commit to a number. And as you come forward, you can pray alone or you can pray with those of us waiting here.